Welcome to the Life After Whipple Project. I'm Greg Adams, a pancreatic cancer survivor and current team leader. Like some of you, I have had the Whipple procedure, not just once, but twice. Because of this, I've lost more organs and tissue than anyone else I can find. For me, living with the aftermath of this surgery has been especially difficult. My struggle to find solutions for the loss of these organs and tissue caught the attention of many people in the pancreatic cancer field here in Michigan who asked me to help them launch this project. Through our monthly presentations and a companion website, we will research, collect, and disseminate information that may be helpful for pancreatic cancer survivors who have had or will have the Whipple procedure. All monthly presentations will be posted on our lifeafterwhipple.com website, along with a lost organ anatomy section currently under construction. This anatomy section will describe each organ or tissue that may get removed during a Whipple procedure. It will list the functions these items use to perform. It will identify the problems that may be caused by the loss of these organs or tissues and will suggest strategies for mitigating these problems. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the Whipple. It saved my life, as did the surgeon who performed both of mine. Without him, there would be no Life After Whipple project. So, without further delay, I would like to introduce my surgeon, one of the best pancreatic cancer surgeons in the country, Dr. David Kwan clinical director of the Henry Ford Pancreatic Cancer Center. Uh, thank you so very much, Mr. Adams, and uh, hello to everyone online. And uh, I see quite a few familiar faces, and uh, it seems like tonight is a celebration of life. And, uh, and if I could give everyone hugs, uh, I'd be giving lots of hugs. Um, and so I'm very honored to be here, very humbled. Um, as many of you know, as, as um, I've been chosen to help serve patients in their darkest needs and their darkest times. And uh, it really is an honor to come talk to you today and, and maybe sort of talk a little bit more about what uh, is going in certain uh, instances going to happen versus what has happened. And in certain instances, just clarification for uh, patients and family members. Um, <clears throat> as to what's going on. Um, over the next couple of minutes, what I'm gonna shortly do is I'm gonna switch over to a screen presentation to sort of explain what is going on to re-educate some of you. Uh, and at any point, uh, if there are any questions, concerns, comments, I think Ms. Fernandez opened up the chat uh, where you can uh, ask questions or make comments and I'll do my very best to respond to them perhaps in real time. So if my eyes are darting to the right or to the left, it's generally because I'm looking at your screen and trying to address um, everyone's questions or concerns. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. And uh, with that, um, this we'll keep this formally informal, meaning if you have any questions or concerns, uh, you can come off of your mute if you'd like, and thereafter um, ask some questions or make some comments. And then I ask that once you're done is perhaps to mute yourself again so we can have other participants uh, weigh in and chime in. So with that is I will share my screen. And Mr. Adams, can you give me a thumbs up if you see the screen? Looks good. Perfect. Um, so very quickly, as I'm very honored to be here, um, I think what is one of the most amazing things of the internet and this virtual world is the amount of information that's out there, but to have someone like Mr. Adams, Mr. and Mrs. Adams collate all this information in a way that people can look at this over the course of time and really understand what's going on in their journey with pancreatic cancer is something that's fundamentally groundbreaking and I'm just so honored to be a part of this and so 
Today, um, I'm very quickly going to talk about the Whipple procedure, which is one component of perhaps three major different types of pancreas operations one may undergo as it pertains to cancers. And so I'll spend a little bit of time explaining um, where tumors are located, why one might be a candidate for surgery or why one might not be a candidate for surgery. And then we'll start, we'll talk a little bit about the Whipple and then uh, some of the consequences associated with that. And thereafter, I think on the next couple of episodes over the course of time, there'll be a lot more opportunity to go more in depth into what's, um, what's going on with these various operations and the consequences. So today will be a 30,000 foot view uh, and at any point, again, feel free to chime in. So very quickly on the left side of your screen is the anatomy of the <clears throat> general area of the pancreas. And I'm going to turn on uh, a laser pointer. And if you follow the outline of the red dot on the screen, this is the pancreas, which is located actually behind the stomach. And if I were to remove the stomach, we would look to the right side of your screen and if once you remove the anterior layer of the stomach you'll see the pancreas which is in yellow in this general area. Adjacent to the pancreas is the small intestine and this is the, the very beginning of the small intestine as it receives food from the stomach. And to the right of the small intestine and posterior is the right kidney and right here to the left of your screen. Uh, would be the left kidney, and there is a spleen that's su so supposed to be there, but is not in this characteristic representation. Most importantly are these vessels, these blood vessels that are running uh, posterior to the pancreas. This is called the portal vein. This red structure here, inferior to the neck of the pancreas, to the right is known as the superior mesenteric artery. And if you go north a little bit, is if you look at these red dots where I'm, I'm circling, this is known as a celiac trunk. And this gives off three branches. One is called the common hepatic artery, which is where I'm highlighting right now. To the left of that, to the right side of my screen, is something called a splenic artery. And there's a third one that would actually go up into the stomach. And this will be something that is fundamentally important for the audience to understand that when the criteria of whether surgery can be offered or not is evaluated is oftentimes based on the location of tumor in relationship to the celiac artery and or the superior mesenteric artery or the superior mesenteric vein. So in terms of understanding whether one has a uh, excuse me one has a tumor that can be operated on there are criteria that surgeons and radiologists look at and they're looking to establish what are called fat planes between the tumor itself which is dark gray here this really bright white spot right here is actually what's called a plastic stent but we look at the tumor in relationship to the blood vessels I previously mentioned the, the portal vein, which is this vessel that's marked as number two, and then the superior mesenteric artery that is marked as one. And between both one and two and the tumor in this area, you see a very dark plane of fat, which is represented by the darker gray, almost black. And that's generally what you want to see um, between the tumor itself and the, the, the blood vessels. And we'll talk about what it means to lose that fat plane shortly. Uh, you wanna make sure that the tumor has not spread to any organs outside of the pancreas area. That would be the liver or the lungs or what's called the peritoneum. And uh, if we can get to that, then we actually have much better survival than even what's recorded uh, today. So in your top left hand corner there's something called resectable disease and then we will talk about something called borderline resectable disease and then we'll talk about locally advanced and unresectable disease but really is when you look this general area here is called the head and the uncinate of the pancreas and if there is a tumor in the head of the pancreas that many of you uh, that i've seen on the list have had an initial tumor here and there is no kissing of the tumor up against these blood vessels here, this would be deemed something that's called resectable. If we move to the middle of the pancreas right here, this is called the body of the pancreas. And in this depiction of this picture right here, you'll see that there is no tumor that's actually touching the superior blood vessels 
or the posterior blood vessels. And based on that is we believe this would be something that we could resect safely. Lastly, is there something that's located in what's called the tail of the pancreas. And in the tail of the pancreas, it, it is okay if the tumor actually is touching these blood vessels that are called the splenic artery or the splenic vein because the splenic artery and vein have to be cut out. And because it's not touching any of the adjacent critical structures here or here, this is something that's deemed resectable and that would be amenable to a surgery. There's a concept, what's called borderline resectable disease. Many patients here that I see on uh, the, the, the Zoom actually uh, would probably be classified as patients who had borderline resectable disease. And this is something where the algorithm and the treatment is such that we get chemotherapy first before we try to consider surgery. And the rationale is, is if you look very closely onto the screen here, you'll see that the tumor itself is kissing up onto the blood vessel. Many of you have heard me say this phrase before, but if you have a tumor that's kissing its blood vessels in layman's term, there's always concern that the tumor could be trying to grow its roots into the bloodstream through these vessels. And if they were to actually get its roots into the system between this tumor itself and the blood vessel, it would send cancer cells to the rest of the body. If you look at this very big pipe, the portal vein, this goes actually directly into the liver. And that's why many people have cancer cells that go straight into the liver. It's because the cancer has been here, gets into the bloodstream here, and then fires up north into the, 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 the liver, or in certain instances can actually make its way into the lungs. So there is a phrase that you'll see in this bottom right hand corner that says abutment of the superior mesenteric vein. That's and you lose that interface or that fat plane between the actual organ itself and the blood vessels. Another example of what's called borderline resectable is when you have this tumor, it's also kissing the blood vessel, but again, is if you look here in the artery, it's coming up right against the lateral wall of the artery. And I'll show you another representation of this in three dimensions on a CT scan, but you, you generally want to make sure that we have an interface of fat between the artery and or vein. And some people have been told that their tumor is in the body or the neck of the pancreas and that it's borderline. In this situation, this is the neck of the pancreas, right where my red, arrow, my red pointer is uh, moving up and down. And you will see that the tumor is kissing up onto this blood vessel here, which is known as a gastroduodenal artery. Another component of a body tumor is if you move the tumor over just a little bit, you'll see it lands on the undersurface of what the celiac or the very north part of the arteries that I was talking about, that the, there's a loss of the fat plane between the tumor itself and the blood vessel here. Um, and then lastly, let me just talk to you about something that's called locally advanced unresectable disease. This is tumor that has not spread to any other parts of the, the body. However, it's where the tumor is located uh, and the way it's growing around blood vessels actually prohibits us as surgeons from necessarily trying to resect this tumor. The vast majority of surgeons in the United States of America in this situation will not perform the operation due to the, the extreme high risk nature of the surgery of removing this tumor. However, there are a few of my colleagues and very good friends that actually will take on the hardest of the hardest, and that, that's generally done at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. But there is a phrase that we're going to use here is encasement. Previously in the borderline receptable, we talked about a, a word called abutment. But encasement means that the tumor is growing not just on the side part of the wall, but it's starting to grow around the vessels themselves. And when they grow around the vessels themselves, if they grow greater than 180 degrees of a circumference of the vessel, then that's considered uh, an encasement. And in, in that case, the general guidelines in the United States uh, under the NCCN guidelines would suggest that surgery is not indicated. And therefore, we call this locally advanced because it's an advanced tumor in that general area and it's considered unreceptible. As 
I'd like to show you on this x-ray here, uh, these are CT scans, but on the left side of your screen, the T stands for tumor and the blue arrow is a representation of how the tumor has come up against this blood vessel here, which is the vein. And you'll see on the right side of the vein where I'm outlining that there's a very dark uh, black sort of area that's called an intact fat plane. However, on this left side, you see that that dark black has actually been lost and there's actually a little bit lighter gray in that area. This lighter gray is actually the tumor that's pushing forward into this blood vessel and we've lost that fat plane. This is called an abutment because it's less than 180 degrees. If you look on the right side of your screen is again the T is the tumor and it's the dark black here. And this here is also a representation of the vein. And on this right side here, you'll see a dark component of fat, but we've lost it on this side here. If you look here, this is black and this is dark gray. And again, is why we say this is encased is because this blood vessels, if we were to go straight up and down here, the gray goes beyond 180 degrees on the circumference of a circle. So this is something that's called encased. And the aorta right here, or is a superior mesenteric artery, which is another blood vessel, is you will see, ideally you wanna see this black area go around in a 360 circumferential manner. And you can see about 270 degrees of this is actually gray, and this is encased with tumor. And so this right side of the screen would be the classification of what's called locally advanced, unresectable. And this left side of the screen would be called something that we talk about as borderline resectable. So the descriptor that I just showed you on that CT scan is on the inferior component of the pancreas. However, if you were to take this tumor and the tumor does go northward, it sometimes can do the exact same thing and grow around these blood vessels especially the red ones right here in a 360 circumferential manner, which would be also what's called encasement of what's the celiac artery. Lastly, just to put things into perspective is if you have a primary tumor here in the pancreas and it has spread to the liver, this is considered stage four disease and therefore would not be a candidate for the consideration of a Whipple. So just very quickly is if you have, just to put things into perspective, is if you have a tumor in the head of the pancreas and you are considered resectable or borderline resectable, the surgery that one would undergo is that it's technically called a pancreatico duodenectomy, but it's also known as the Whipple surgery for which many of you are here uh, to learn specifically about. Um, if you have resectable disease in the body of the pancreas, then the actual surgery that one undergoes is what's called a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. And to put that into perspective is imagine if we cut the pancreas right here, moved everything to the right of your screen, that would require us to remove the pancreas, which is called the distal pancreas. And then here is the spleen and we would remove the spleen. Lastly is if you have a tumor in what's called a tail of the pancreas, you would also undergo what's called a pancreatectomy and splenectomy, and we would remove the pancreas with the tumor and the spleen. So I think the reality is today's conversation is about the pancreatic duodenectomy. Herein, for the rest of the conversation, I'm really just going to call it the Whipple procedure. It was named after Dr. Whipple. But there are four major parts to the operation. Uh, in the before on your left hand side of the screen and sequentially I'm going to talk to you about what we're going to do is the first thing we do is we end up cutting what's called the bile duct and the bile duct drains the liver here. And the, we would cut the bile duct, we would cut the stomach, we would cut a piece of the intestine and then we would cut the neck of the pancreas in order to get out the tumor that's right here. Um, and if you look to the right side of your screen. This is how the reconnections work, is after we cut out the organs under these dotted lines on the left side of your screen, we have to reconnect the pancreas here. We have to reconnect the bile duct so that the liver can continue to function and secrete the bile. And then ultimately we have to put the stomach back together and we'll talk about this and, and how this affects quality of life thereafter. 
Um, some of you have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. This is sort of like a major kitchen remodel as we, uh, the amount of stuff that has to be removed is no different than completely gutting a kitchen and going down to studs. And as you can see, the natural habitat is food comes into the stomach and goes into the intestine. But when you look at this, this is a complete remodel of a kitchen is the water lines been moved, the gas lines been moved and everything's put back together. So to be very quite honest, the body doesn't like this. Um, and as surgeons, we've still not figured out why some people do remarkably well and then why some people do not. So as we talk about the Whipple very quickly, um, it's breaking, broken down into six essential steps that the surgeon has to perform every single time. Um, step one is those blood vessels that I showed you at the inferior portion of the pancreas is we have to isolate those out because if in the wrong hands of a surgeon, an uh, improper surgeon, this can cause life-threatening bleeding. So this is a very technical step that requires us to be extremely careful. Um, the second part of the operation that you just saw with the little two requires us to do what's called a medial visceral rotation, but this duodenum that's connected to the stomach needs to be brought out from its native position. You go into the third portion where you begin to cut the bile ducts from the liver. The fourth portion is where you cut the stomach. The fifth portion is where you cut uh, about 18 inches of intestine. And then the sixth uh, portion of the operation is where you actually cut the pancreas and take it off of its blood supply. Um, so that first step is, if we we're to put this into cartoon representation, it's to isolate this blood vessel because the tumor is always very close to this blood vessel. And so this is a very uh, hairy portion of the operation in that if you're in the wrong plane, there is a possibility that you would leave microscopic tumor uh, on the blood vessel itself. And that's something that is uh, that surgeons do everything in their power to try to avoid. The second portion of the operation is where this is now the back side of that pancreas tumor here is imagine as if I were to grab this intestine and to flip it over towards this colon side right here is I've taken it and I flipped it over. Now we're looking on the back side of the tumor. And what we have to do is take this back side of the, it's the inferior most portion, of the deepest portion of the operation. And we need to take it off of the, uh, what's called the inferior vena cava and the aorta. These two are also uh, critical structures that if you get into this can cause life-threatening bleeding. The third step requires us to cut what's called the bile ducts. So as you can see in this picture is the liver is in the, the burgundy and the liver makes bile and the, it sends bile usually into the bile duct. It gets stored into the gallbladder. And then when you and I eat, uh, when I eat my McDonald's quarter pounder, the gallbladder squeezes and sends out bile to help with the absorption of food. The fourth portion of the operation is for us to transect the stomach. You'll see this portion here is a transected stomach. And your first question that may be coming up is why am I taking so much stomach? This is a traditional way that a Whipple was first done in 19, the early 1900s. Uh, we'll talk about a variation of this, but ultimately all of this is, as you, if you look at these arrows, have common blood supply to the tumor right here where I'm circling. And if you actually look, there are common blood supplies to these areas. The reason why you, you want to take this much area is because if they share a common channel, there's a possibility that cancer spreads to these areas as well. So that's step four. Step five is we cut. If you look here, this is a stomach that we're cutting out with the, the head of the pancreas and this intestine attached to the pancreas. That too has to come out for fear of leaving cancer or cancer being in this general area. So this portion of the intestine is cut. That's step five. And then step six is where we begin the process of actually cutting the pancreas from its rest of its supply, excuse me, taking the pancreas off where the tumor is and thereafter uh, taking off some of the planes. Uh, there is a chat and I'm gonna try to do this as I'm looking at my slide. Um, how does one catch a cancer early enough to qualify for the surgery? Uh, thank you for that question. It is a million dollar question. There is no good 
early detection test currently. Um, this is a problem. That's why 80% of the time these are actually found too late because they're one where the pancreas is located, uh, especially in the head, there are non-specific symptoms that one might exhibit suggesting that uh, you have the development of a pancreas cancer. Um, that generally is maybe perhaps some of you have heard this is you may present with non-specific sort of back pain. That's very similar to when people like me as I'm getting older is I wake up in the morning, I bend over to put on my shoes and I have this weird back pain. Um, those are this is very vague symptoms. There are other symptoms that are called painless jaundice, um, where your eyes turn yellow and your urine turns uh, very dark, sort of like Lipton iced tea. But oftentimes that is not early enough to be detected. So uh, I think in the future iterations, we can sort of talk about what's coming in the horizon in the next five to 10 years. And, uh, you know, we will officially announce, at least through our organization, that we'll be participating uh, in a new early detection test that might be beneficial for either your loved ones uh, or your friends who are very interested in looking to see if this is um, uh, valuable or not. Um, just to let everyone know, it's the when they talk about getting a second opinion um, for pancreas cancer surgery, the rationale behind this is people that are trained to do this surgery um, do something quite radical at the time of surgery again is if you were to follow my arrow right now is there we talked about tumor being left on these blood vessels so there's an inordinate amount of time that's required to actually dissect out tissue around these blood vessels again this is a little bit harrowing for those that aren't uh, trained specifically to do this because if you get into this blood these blood vessels they can cause life-threatening bleeding but it has been shown and shown time and time again is this portion right here is the most critical component of the operation in terms of making sure that there's no cancer cells left. And so this is uh, really this whole area is the area of concern when one does the operation. And, and that's why uh, you're encouraged if you were to go on the pan can or if you talk to other people is to to really make sure that your pancreas cancer surgeon has been well trained, especially in this area of dissection. So I, this is another picture of the representation of how things look when we're all said and done is we take out the tumor and then the reconstruction begins. And the reconstruction begins in a counterclockwise fashion where we put the pancreas back together and then we put the bile duct back together and then we put the stomach back together to restore continuity uh, of your intestines. Um, the rationale for me showing these following pictures are so that we can start talking about life after the Whipple that Mr. Adams is really wanting to educate uh, most people about is we have to put the pancreas back together and the pancreas will talk about its functions uh, really has two major functions. It's an endocrine function and in this situation it's the production of insulin and it has an exocrine function. So an endocrine and an exocrine function. The exocrine function is basically the production of amylases, lipases, tryptases, proteins, and uh, as I've said before, equivalently acids um, that help in the digestion of uh, food and meat that the body takes in. So in this picture here is a descriptor of a of the of what's the best phrase to put this is the it's called the anastomosis of the pancreas but simply put is putting the pancreas back together so that through this pipe right here where my red dot is is the pancreas can secrete its exocrine uh amylases and proteins that will then mix with the bile that'll come in here so that it can get to the stomach and help with the digestion of food um, as we come to your right here is after the pancreas has been put back together and we go, so then the pancreas juices will move this way from right to left on your screen and it will, re it will meet up with the bile that is secreted by the liver. And this is an example of uh, the bile duct being reconnected to the intestine. 
And then we go back to here as if you look to your right side of your screen as you have the pancreas that was put back together that secretes its uh, enzymes, the bile that's secreted by the liver together these two come in this fashion if you follow the arrow and we'll meet up with the stomach where there's been food that has been digested and together they all meet here and go to the rest of the body. So I want to talk about the three components of the reconstruction because these are the things that affect me and affect the patient the most. The first being the technical considerations of putting the pancreas back together is what surgeons worry about the most. The green is the bile duct connection, which tends to be the least problematic of the three reconnections. And then the stomach, which is in yellow, um, tends to be the area that causes patients the most uh, angst, concern, and quality, uh, lifestyle issues. Uh, question. Uh, how is a total pancreatectomy different in reconstruction? That is a great question, Mr. Adams. Uh, in a total pancreatectomy, let me get out of this, is the, I think if you see my screen and you can see the remnant pancreas where my red dot is going, is you, a total pancreatectomy does not have this connection because there's no pancreas left. So the reconstruction after a total pancreatectomy and there are some that I've had it, there are some that will undergo it, is if you have to get a completion pancreatectomy after Whipple, it will be this part that's removed right here, this intestine with the remnant pancreas, and the spleen that would have been attached right here. Uh, if you do a total pancreatectomy from the beginning, there is no connection here. There are only two connections, which would be the bile duct and the stomach. Hopefully that helps. The rationale for why I wanted to talk about the stomach is because of the following. This is when I talk with patients and we counsel our patients, this is the, the sort of area that causes patients the most concern in terms of quality of life. We talk about the stomach's ability to contract. And if you can see me on the screen is, um, some of you have seen me use this analogy, is when we fill up our stomach, it's like filling up a water balloon with water. And if you were to let the water go, it just sprays out and then the, the, the balloon contracts like this. So the stomach, when it fills up with food, distends, and then it naturally begins to squeeze to help with digestion and to push the food forward. After this operation, the stomach does not squeeze at the rates that it normally does before the operation. So if the stomach is squeezing at 100 miles an hour, uh, in a simplest analogy, after the operation, sometimes it squeezes at 10 miles an hour up to 50 to 70 or 80. There's no way to actually determine when or how fast the stomach will get to back to its original pace. But if the stomach is not squeezing to the level that it understood itself to do before the operation, then patients feel very nauseated. Patients actually burp a lot, belch a lot, people get hiccups, and it's because the stomach does not have the ability in that moment to squeeze down. So there's a lot of stuff that just sits in the stomach, and as if you think about it here, is you can see that the acid comes here, the, the bile is produced here, and is supposed to make its way into the stomach. And if all of it that just sits there, people get very nauseated and can end up vomiting quite often. And so this really affects the quality of life of our patients. So if we go back to this component of the pancreas, uh, the part that concerns me the most is if the connection is not watertight, um, this is a problem where people talk about having uh, some really bad consequences and infections after a Whipple. The national average of this connection leaking is up to 40% in the United States of America. There are multiple factors associated with that, and we, I won't get into it completely, but this is the part that the surgeon worries about most, because if that acid sort of leaks, then it wreaks habit uh, all around this general area of where the surgery is. Uh, for those that have had the Whipple, this is why uh, we had drains um, that were 
in this general vicinity, it was to extract out any chemical that potentially could leak, because what has been shown in national studies that is if there is a leak and it's not drained, it can lead to higher risk of death because it just starts dissolving the internal organs and can subsequently cause some major havoc. But as a patient, if, you, if we go back again to the major function of the pancreas, I said there are two major things that we had to take into consideration. One is a production of gluc uh, insulin uh, that, and therefore regulates our body, body's blood sugar, excuse me. And then it's also associated with a, 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 a very intimate role with the digestive system where they secrete the enzyme rich fluids to aid in digestion. Um, aha. Uh, Mr. Adams again asking, since pancreatic tissue is not firm, how do you get sutures to stick to it? Um, if we were to go back to this uh, picture, uh, you'll see that there's suture. These black lines are suture that uh, actually hold the pancreas and the intestine in place. There are various methods by which the pancreas is reconnected together. Uh, there are multiple techniques that are described in our surgical world, such as the Bloomgart, the modified Bloomgart uh, procedure, and vagination. There have been multiple um, multiple attempts at creating the optimal connection, and ultimately, it's uh, really more dependent on, as you're suggesting, the gland texture of the pancreas. Most healthy people who have a healthy pancreas have a very soft pancreas. And actually, as a surgeon, you want something very firm to sew to. Um, so in this situation, being a healthy individual with a normal pancreas is not always in one's best uh, favor. Uh, there, in terms of connection, is despite the best of hands, um, again, is the national rates up to 40% of the time there's a component of a leak. Uh, it has been documented that the more experience one has, the lower the, the leak rate is. But even in the best of hands and the best of surgeons, the leak rate still continues to exist. Um, so at the time of surgery, in those drains or straws that are put next to the pancreas, a couple of days after the surgery, uh, most surgeons will actually test the fluid that are coming out of the drains. And what they will do is check it for something called an amylase, which is one of the sort of markers of the, uh, the pancreas production. And if in the drain, the value of the amylase is greater than three times of what the blood value of the amylase is, then we start worrying about this chemical leak that we, we just started talking about. And this is graded into three general areas. A biochemical leak is if my blood level of the amylase is 55 and I have a biochemical leak is something of say 170. Uh, it's three times greater than 55, but still not super high. And I'll explain what super high can be. Oftentimes this is inconsequential and just near, is, is named a biochemical leak and for which this is something that the doctors will just watch. Grade B pancreatic fistula and grade C pancreatic fistulas are when the consequences are a little bit more dire where the, the drain amylase may be in the thousands or there may be persistent or what's called high output coming from the drains where the pancreas is just outright leaking and um, there's just that pancreatic fluid that's coming into the drains. These are managed somewhat differently, but they're generally treated on the more conservative side with antibiotics and you just keep the drain in and in a situation where it's it's producing a lot of this fluid um, it would be considered what's called a grade c pancreatic fistula and oftentimes you have to go back to the operating room and try to either fix the connection or you put in more straws to take care of the situation to try to make sure that none of it actually sits and has the opportunity to start uh, degrading or breaking down other various organs in the body. Um, something that we're, I think we're going to spend more time with over the course of these series is talking about the long-term consequences of uh, the endocrine component of the, the pancreas for which we talk about the regulation of blood sugar and people who Develop pancreas cancer oftentimes have diabetes, but then when you take out what's called the head of the pancreas in the Whipple, that's where the vast majority of the islet cells produce insulin 
So you're actually removing a lot of the pancreas cells that help regulate your, your blood sugar. So patients can develop type two diabetes, which is a resistance to uh, insulin that's over the course of time and age. But there's something called type three diabetes, which is a little known phenomenon um, that is beginning to uh, gain a little bit more traction in the medical world because we're having patients survive a lot longer. And what I mean by that is type three in the simplest form is surgeon induced, surgery induced uh, diabetes. And there are consequences to that. And I see some people chuckling and yes, I'm responsible for type three diabetes. <laughs> and I apologize in advance. Um, this is going to be an interesting phenomenon because as we're seeing more and more patients survive with pancreas cancer, type three diabetes will become front and stage. Um, and this is something that really in this day and age, a lot of people still don't know a lot about, and this is going to continue to evolve. Simply cannot be managed as simply as type two diabetes. Type three is surgery induced, and there's a lot more going on than I think we completely understand right now. The other thing is <clears throat> because we took out the head of the pancreas, patients don't necessarily produce as much of that enzyme um, that acid that we're talking about to help aid in digestion. So this is called uh, exocrine pancreas insufficiency. So we hear about this on TV now. There's a lot of commercials that, that are called EPI, but this is surgically induced exocrine pancreas insufficiency is despite having your about 50% of your pancreas left, the 50% the that was removed actually can cause, uh, can be enough so that you have exocrine pancreas insufficiency for which then you would need to take uh, enzymes, pancreatic enzymes to help in digestion for the rest of your life. Um, the part that I wanna spend a little bit amount of time with is talking about the antrectomy, the stomach portion. And this is a component of the operative technique that has evolved over time. And over the past 20 years, we went from this antrectomy to something called a pylorus preserving. And now a lot of people are 50-50 on whether one does one or the other, because the long-term data at one year shows there's actually no difference in terms of quality of life and gastric function between doing what's called a antrectomy versus a pylorus preserving. Um, uh, pancreatectomy. So what I'd like to do to the audience right now is to sort of describe the concept of what people have complained about as patients in terms of quality of life and why the pylorus preserving uh, technique was introduced. And if, we, if I draw your attention to the left side of the screen, Again, is if we talked about, just to review what we talked about, the pancreas secretes enzymes here the bile duct from the liver secretes its bile here. And if you follow the arrow, then all of that fluid will come down through the intestine and it's supposed to meet up with the stomach. In reality, what happens is the food, again, because the stomach is not squeezing so well, um, you will actually have more of this fluid, we'll just call biliary juice, end up in the stomach and mixing with the stomach. Hmm. And then it eventually makes its way out. But what ends up happening is this production of bile is so much that it ends up sort of being in the stomach and just sort of sitting there. Now, if you can imagine, this is an upright position, but if I were to lay down and I had a whole bunch of bile in my stomach, when I lay down, some people complain at night that they feel like they taste bile in their throat. It's because some of this bile fluid that's just in the stomach starts via gravity going upwards and people complain of reflux like symptoms and saying that they can taste bile. For this reason, <clears throat> some surgeons propose what is called a pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenectomy. So pylorus preserving Whipple. The pylorus is this black line right here which is a muscle and it's basically a valve. So when your stomach gets food into it, so when I eat my hamburger, going back to McDonald's, it sort of sits in the stomach and this valve open and closes at 
at intervals that allow a little bit of food to come in and go into the intestine at a time. But because it's a one-way valve, it also prevents bile from technically getting into stomach. So if we are to again take that um, picture and we take the pancreatic juices and you take the, the bile and it oh, comes man, towards the intestine. I have a knife in my stomach. But... And so what would end up happening is that this bile, as it's coming through here, because of the valve of the pylorus, is unable to make it into the stomach, like we talk about on this left side of the screen. And then it would end up moving down to the rest of the body. So there is a phrase called alkaline bile reflux. And we believe that the pylorus actually prevents alkaline uh, py, uh, reflux. And for this reason, some people are rather big proponents of a pylorus preserving Whipple. Now here is the issue. We talked about the stomach squeezing after the operation. If we have problems with the stomach squeezing and moving food forward, and we have a valve that is not allowing food to move forward at a very fast rate, it actually can make the patients feel worse. And so what ends up happening is though it prevents biliary reflux, it can worsen the symptoms of nausea, early satiety, and actually increase vomiting. However, we talked about the stomach taking time to pick back up its squeezing. When we look at the most recent data comparing these two, in the immediate 30-day period, patients generally feel better with a pylorus preserving uh, operation. At one year after the stomach has effectively picked up its speed and ability to contract and move things forward, there's actually no difference in terms of quality of life, in terms of symptoms or reflux uh, between these two operations. Surgeons will sometimes have hesitation, myself included, about doing this component of the pylorus preserving operation because the blood supply to this small piece of intestine right here, that's right next to the pylorus, that blood supply is compromised at the time of operation. And over the course of time, if you have compromised blood flow, then certain things happen where you get something that are called strictures. So that connection between the stomach and this intestine here gets tighter and tighter. And when you don't have enough blood flow, things don't stretch as well. And therefore people actually have worse symptoms. And so um, surgeons will ultimately work with the patients to decide what would be the best uh, treatment for them. Um, all right. So um, the technical term is called delayed gastric emptying. And that's again, the ability to the stump for the stomach to squeeze forward the food products that we take into our stomach. Um, really, if you look at this number across the range of people who have recorded their outputs and um, people that have had delayed gastric emptying, 19 to 57%. So this is one component of medicine that, to be very honest, surgeons have no idea why one person may not have it as badly as another. Factors that are associated with delayed gastric emptying that we know about, however, for example, are people that have had long standing diabetes. They have a component called diabetic gastroparesis, where because of the diabetes and the suboptimal blood flow and therefore suboptimal blood flow to nerves, it's been proposed that the, the stomach doesn't squeeze as well um, with diabetics. So if you have bad long-standing diabetes, plus you have the surgery, the likelihood that you're going to have um, delayed gastric emptying is significantly higher than a very young patient that's uh, considered quite healthy. But to be very honest, it's, um, it's an enigma. And I, I would propose it's an enigma because um, at the time of the stomach operation is if you cut the nerves and you have to cut some of the stomach nerves to cut out part of the stomach, the more nerves you cut, 
less likely that the stomach is going to squeeze very well. And so that some might argue that's why you, you would do a pylorus preserving uh, pancreatic duodenectomy with its associated risks um, of either strictures or um, that can occur long term. So in the hospital, many of you will have what are called nasogastric tubes or tubes in your nose that are pumping out your stomach. And there are a series of tests that are performed throughout a hospitalization to assess the function of how well the stomach begins to squeeze. Um, there are various components, again, similar to the previous picture I showed you, a pancreatic fistulas of a green, yellow, red light, sort of like a signal light. Um, those grade A's are generally considered very, very benign. It's just a matter of days before the stomach starts pumping. Um, if you have a grade B there, it's, you know, about a week to 10 days. And then people that are in the red section, they have an NG tube in or the tube in their nose for over two weeks, or you, every time you pull it out, you have to pull, put it back in because the stomach really is not squeezing very well. Um, and this is very lifestyle limiting. The people, interestingly, that have no gastroparesis or no delayed gastric emptying have their tube taken out within two days and are already eating food by the third to fifth day and go home eating regular food. And again, there is no way for surgeons to predict other than longstanding diabetes, whether a patient might develop any of this delayed gastric emptying. So with this component is there are two real ways that you can medically treat the stomach that isn't squeezing so hard. Um, if I were to go back to if I were to go back to this picture, is one of the medicines that we give is something called Reglan. And what Reglan does, it stimulates actually the small intestine and not the stomach. It stimulates the small intestine to actually squeeze harder so that whatever fluids it gets, it moves it at a faster rate so it either can clear the stomach or it, it um, can be at a fast enough clip so that it can bypass really sitting in the stomach. A second component to treating the delayed gastric emptying is actually stimulating the stomach itself. There are something called motilin receptors that are responsible for the contraction of the stomach, the squeezing of the stomach, and that is something that you can use. It has limited utility, and uh, and it has limited utility because once you saturate the receptors or turn on the modulin receptor, uh, you can't keep turning it on even more intensely. It just turns on and there's no way to go from 55 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. So what uh, ends up happening is people will do a, a, a limited dosing of what's called erythromycin, which affects the stomach to help it squeeze. However, the more commonly used medicine is called Reglan, which, help, uh, which helps move the small intestine. So it actually can help whatever's in the stomach push forward uh, by way of the exit channel. Uh, as I talked about before is the consequences of this is because um, of the reconstruction of the stomach is we need to do a couple of things is when you do the stomach surgery, what we do is we cut a couple nerves and by doing so it alters the acid production and can increase acid production and for the if you think about sort of in the older eras of the 50s 60s 70s where people had ulcers gastric ulcers. Uh, the operation would be to go on an acid reducing pill and to cut the nerves and so we uh, patients who have had a Whipple. Uh, should be on lifelong acid uh, reduction, uh, whether it's something with a, a protonic, so a, a proton pump inhibitor or another acid reflux pill. Uh, it is generally accepted that one has um, this pill for the rest of their lives. It's interesting is if you were to do an endoscopy for people who have undergone Whipples, um, they're oftentimes already developing ulcers with the combination of the mixture of the acid production as well as the bile reflux we we're talking about. Bile is actually basic and can cause an alkaline uh, acid uh, sort of ulcer. Excuse me, an alkaline ulcer. Uh, lastly is the biliary reflux we talked about is when you lay down and if there's a lot of bile in the stomach, it can go up into the throat and cause reflux. And that's something that uh, un unfortunately, if people have undiagnosed something called hiatal hernias where they have a piece of their stomach in their, their throat, 
um, patients oftentimes uh, develop really bad reflux that require uh, lifestyle and sleeping modifications. And so with that is, uh, I want to say mahalo, apparently. Uh, I'm currently in Hawaii uh, enjoying a family vacation. And uh, this is uh, two days ago, I went uh, snorkeling with my family. And, and I cannot thank Mr. and Mrs. Adams enough because they gave us this recommendation uh, to go snorkeling. And uh, this was a once in a lifetime experience. and. With that, I want to say thank you. I want to again thank Mr. and Mrs. Adams uh, for this opportunity, and and I am open to any questions. Thank you.